All right, thank you. And uh, great to see everybody here. Um, I'm really excited to be able to share what is going on and the opportunities that we had. Uh, just as a reminder, please make sure to mute yourself. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and mute mute all. Um, and then at the end, when there's a chance for Q and A, uh, obviously you can unmute and communicate. <coughs> all right. Well, let me uh, share my screen and share from the field here. As many of you know, we spent uh, just over two weeks between Malawi and Zambia end of May, early June. So you should be able to see my screen at this point. And there's just uh, amazing things going on in, in that part of the world that we wanted to bring back the stories and, and to be able to share what, what so many of us are doing together. Really, we're just the tip of the iceberg. We're we're just the ambassadors when we're traveling in these countries and working with our various partners and our own staff and country. But really, it takes a large network of people, a lot, a lot of supporters, a lot of prayer partners, a lot of people who are volunteering, our staff, our board of directors. And so it's really um, quite an honor to be able to represent everybody out there. For those of us uh, a little less familiar with where Zambia and Malawi are, you can see in the red circle, the little sliver of a country is Malawi and then right next door on the left is Zambia. So this is the southeastern part of Africa. And of course, in the times that we live in, our our past to be able to travel these days includes getting negative COVID results, which wasn't too bad um, on this side of the pond at least. And so that allowed us to get on the plane. And uh, as things are loosening up in the United States, even in Ohio here where where we were just in church last Sunday without masks, things are getting tighter and more restrictive in Africa as COVID is starting to hit harder. And, and the messaging and, and supplies, like what Design Outreach has done through our partners and through our own team is starting to hit more of the headlines. Uh, this is uh, very early in the morning as we get ready to head out and catch an airplane about 3 a.m. in our driveway heading out. I promise the pictures will get better from here. Don't have to stare at me in a blurry picture, but early morning and we fly about 26 hours and a couple stops over to Malawi and that's where we're going to start. So Malawi is the, the warm heart of Africa and one of one of my favorite places to visit. Um, of course, we work in 10 different countries and, and this is where we have our first international office. Um, on arrival, Dixon picked us up in our land cruiser and this was at our lodge that we stayed at initially on the first night. So the plan was to fly into Lilongwe, the capital, and go from there across the border to Zambia to start our work in country. And uh, you probably remember from last last year in December, we were able to go over and start our, our field office. And so that was really the, the launch of the building of the warehouse. And this is Ray who traveled with me on the first part of the trip. Ray is, is quite an amazing guy in himself, uh, retired recently from Kellogg's in Michigan and works essentially full time with Design Outreach and is one of our, our travel members uh, who goes and helps build capacity in the different countries we work in. He had just gotten off a plane from Guatemala and a few weeks later he's turning around going to Malawi and Zambia with me. So this is our office in Malawi and as I mentioned last December, we just set this up and, and part of the work that was even done between then and now was building some shelves and getting more organized, which was always good to see, including our warehouse, which is on the right hand side. It's the inside of a 40 foot container, still looking really good, well organized, our systems are working. And on the left is not a jail cell, but that's where we put our backup generator so that it's well ventilated and is not uh, doesn't, doesn't grow legs and walk away. And so that was new since we were there. That was just being built and got finished in the meantime since December. So part of the work was was going across the border into Zambia. Now this is me once again, of course, eating one of my favorite foods when I'm traveling in that part of the world, which is a samosa. So if you've had the chance of being part of our our life in Malawi events, you'll you'll get to experience samosas and maybe even made samosas. And so this is basically fast food in Malawi. So we're driving to the border here. The border crosses into Zambia and this is near 
the city of Chapada. So Chapada is a district in, in the town there. And that's where we have some new life pumps going in right now. And the border is, is a little chaotic. There's a lot of people at times. Uh, there's a lot of vehicles going through. There's a checkpoint. So there's, there's, there's boats that come into the ports and then they get trucked down. And so a lot of trucking companies are crossing the border and paying their duty. And sometimes these trucks can sit there for two or three days while they figure out how much duty is going to cost and, and then how they're going to pay for it. And so this is just part of that, that scene there. As I mentioned, we're in Zambia, the first part. Uh, during the first part, we, we were going to, to do a number of things, including training a new partner and, um, and, and refreshing training with several government officials who are part of our training system. And we started that by going to one of our brand new partners called Living Water International. This is a Christian NGO, and they hosted us in their conference room along with uh, various representatives from government around the country who we've trained um, with the first steps of our training process. And then this is part of their refresher course. So you can see um, there's there's people from town councils and city councils from different areas of the country. And so they all came together in the western, the eastern side of the Ambia, sorry, in order to um, be part of two installations and a refresher on the theoretical classroom part of the work that we do. Um, and and part of that is is just reminding best practices and procedures. So as we've created extensive manuals, um, these manuals are are they kind of look like an IKEA style manual, and so it's supposed to be easy to follow uh, with very few words and to be able to refresh people who've been trained in person. And so part of that is laying everything out, making sure that nothing's missing. If there's even one thing missing, it can it can mean the difference between getting a pump installed or not. And so that's a really bad day. And one of the big steps is training, making sure that everything is there, the tools, the parts. Our first village was this village called Longway. Uh, and yes, that is spelled right. I had to double check a couple times because it seems like there should be another vowel in there somewhere. But this community is in, in the Chapada district. And this is what we found when we when we got into the community. Very, very typical site, very typical situation. Um, grass roofs, mud walls. And, and we were able to talk with some ladies there and they were very excited. They were getting a life pump. Uh, they were excited that, that we were there and wanted to, to get to know their, their story, including this lady who was making uh, very traditional food in Malawi and Zambia, the Ensima. So also for those of us who have experienced life in Malawi, our, our, um, our experience in a box that helps you understand and the sights, sounds, and smells of Malawi will recognize the Ensima, which is basically ground cornmeal and water mixed together, which is one of the staple foods in Malawi and Zambia and some other countries there. As we were talking, we were learning about where people were getting water from in this community. And this is while the pump was starting to be installed. This community had dug an open well a handful of years ago. So this is the well that was in, in the community. And before that, they were getting water from a nearby river. And as you can see, this, this opening, it actually goes down about 12 meters. So this is a very deep open well. And I can't imagine how they dug this well. Somebody would have had to go down in that hole and dig that deep that far. And they're pulling the water out, and the water looks uh, clear, which is also one of the challenges in in education because a lot of times people equate clear water with safe water, and this is this is certainly contaminated water, being surface water, having surface runoff, having lots of animals that were running around this particular well, and it was also very concerning seeing this open well where the opening is big enough for a bucket and it's certainly big enough for a child to fall down in there, which is a very un uh, uh, which is a, a very tragic situation uh, far too often where kids end up falling in wells and drowning, um, which is not an uncommon situation. So part of this was um, helping to fix that problem. And we had a partner who wanted this community to have a, a life pump and, and provided the drilling and the well. And we were there as part of installation training. So we, we don't go and just install pumps, but we always build capacity. So you notice in the picture, these are some of the guys that we started with in the training of trainers, and, and they're leading this installation with us just watching from a distance. And lo and behold, this was a very, a very quick, very easy 
installation, praise the Lord, because sometimes they get a little trickier and water started flowing and, and people were quite excited. Um, and that's that's always one of the, the biggest joys of what we get to do is to is to be in these communities and, and see this happen and see and see the joy that people have. And then traditionally, as we uh, celebrate with the community, we we usually bring uh, bread like people will take like a slice of bread or some candy for, for kids and, and some soft drinks. So like Coca-Cola or Fanta or pineapple flavored drinks and sharing that with the community, which is a really big deal for the community. And, and it's truly a, a celebration. And, you know, interestingly, in return, they like to do a favor back to us. And in this case, which is not uncommon, they gave us a chicken, um, which I had to laugh because uh, the chicken was actually handed to Ray. And, and Ray is kind of like me and that doesn't know what to do with a chicken. So, so Munga, who is one of the guys that works with us in Zambia on the left here holding the chicken, he took the chicken and said that, that he would take care of it. It went in the back of the truck and I think somebody probably had uh, chicken dinner that night. So this is a really big deal um, that a community would give us a chicken. This is a huge deal. This is this is them showing their appreciation. This is a big deal uh, and, and a very valuable thing. So it just goes to show the importance that, that even is communicated and, and that people can see and, and just realizing it's gonna help transform their lives. We, uh, we went to the next day back um, after resting that night in, in the Chapada city and went back to another community where this was a bit more of an eventful day. Uh, thankfully, it still had a happy ending, but it didn't start off so well. Uh, one, of, one of the first things is we're driving along, we went out about 45 minutes and next thing I know, I, I hear that, that telltale sign, uh, that sound from the truck and sure enough, we had a flat tire and these are these are just very difficult roads. Um, they're they're big. They have big ruts. They have lots of rocks, and it's not uncommon to get flat tires, even with uh, reinforced sidewall vehicle tires um, on these uh, sort of essentially off-road vehicles that we call Land Cruisers here. And um, and it's interesting because I was thinking about this. I think in all of my years of driving in the United States, I got one. I've had one flat tire total. And, and the many times I've visited different countries, I've probably had a half a dozen flat tires riding. And, um, and it just goes to show the necessity of having technologies that last a very long time are very durable because transportation, just getting to the communities is very difficult and very costly because those tires are not cheap. Uh, the vehicles are not cheap. And so transportation is very difficult. So having technologies that last is very important. But we, we arrived and it was, um a, another sort of typical scene in this case this community had uh, a former pump it was an india mark ii pump the pump had been installed a number of years ago and it's had lots of breakdown issues and so living water international our implementing partner in this case decided to replace that pump and do a retrofit with a light pump which is a common way to use light pumps and this community had experienced a lot of breakdowns and, and, um, and it was just really hurting the community. And it was a fairly large population, about 2000 people lived in this area. So we got started right away. Uh, the, the community was watching in anticipation. Um, our pump crew was, was uh, they got started right away and got, got working. And then in the meantime, we found a little bit of shade and, and gathered the community. So, there were a lot of people gathered around and you can see Beatrice and you can see uh, the gentleman standing. His name is Victor. He was from Living Water, Zambia. And they presented to the community. They shared with the community uh, why they were there, what they were doing. They shared the gospel and it was very clear and it was it was very exciting to be there and see the response from the community members. And um, and you can see there's a few chairs, which which is always a little awkward for somebody like myself where you see all the people sitting on the ground and they put the few chairs that they have from the community up front where the special guests, in this case, um, the, the crew from Living Water and from Design Outreach were able to sit. And this is this is a way of showing appreciation and honor. Um, and so it was it was a really, really neat time. We recorded several testimonies from different community leaders and just how uh, they've been struggling with water problems, how they're thankful they're getting a light pump. It's just a really neat thing to be able to witness. However, while we were doing this, uh, Ray came walking over and gave me a little thumbs down. And, and right away I knew this wasn't good uh, because we were almost ready to move everybody from the shade over to the pump 
and, and see water flowing and lots of celebration. Um, the problem was that the pump had been put in and they started turning the handles and no water was coming out. And then no one was quite sure why that was. So by the time I got over to the pump, which, just, which, which was just a short walk, uh, we got over there and they were already pulling the pump out to investigate what the problem was. And so we're speculating, we're guessing, we're trying to decide, you know, what to do next and what, what could possibly be the issue. Um, because there's very few things that could go wrong. And, but, but clearly something wasn't right. And so we, they pull it completely out and we can't find a single thing wrong. And I'm on the phone. I had cell phone signal in this area and I'm, I'm talking to a couple of people in the U.S. here who've had experience putting in lots of pumps and, and, and we, we're scratching our heads. And so we decide, okay, let's put it back in. So they put the pump back in. And when the pump is almost completely installed, somehow a bottom section of pipe came unscrewed. And thankfully, it didn't fall through because of the drive rod being connected. Long story short, the pump had to be pulled out a second time. Now, this was 18 sections of three meter length pumps, pipes, which takes about an hour of hard lifting to get this out of the ground. And this is all done manually. And so by the time the second time happened, we're now scratching our heads even a little harder trying to figure out what's going on. And they pull the pump out and we decide, okay, it must be a loose joint at the very bottom section, which was the only place that could possibly possibly be the culprit. And lo and behold, uh, they tightened it. But at this point, it was starting to get dark because in Zambia, in this part of Zambia, it's pitch black at 5.30 p.m. And I thought for sure we were going back to the hotel. We're coming back first, first light in the morning on Saturday. And next thing I know, they tighten up the bottom section even more. And next thing I know, they're starting to put the pump back in. Well, in this, at this point, we're just doing this by headlights because there's, there's no more sunlight um, available. And I was just uh, really struck at this point in this moment of, of the endurance and, and determination by the pump technicians to put this pump in regardless, because you can see just a little bit of a glimpse here, how many people are sitting around watching. It's pitch black, uh, doing this by headlight. And I was just really encouraged that the pump technicians were not ready to go back to the hotel and, and come back in the morning, but they knew people needed water that night. They needed water, um, not the next day, 12 hours later or something. Um, long story short, and praise the Lord, the pump goes in this time. It works perfectly. There was a big celebration, and it was time to go back, um, which was uh, kind of a, a change of plans for us. So we had to find a hotel at 10 o'clock at night, which is not the simplest thing to do in Zambia, but we were able to find a hotel and rest and, and head back to Malawi the next day. Ah, a lot of good stuff going on. Um, and so we head back to Malawi. And this is Sunday now. Uh, Hugo and Bree, who are shown in the left, they ended up joining us uh, in Malawi. So they came a few days later. Hugo and Bree are Americans. Uh, Hugo is an engineer, works for Design Outreach, and they're moving as a family to Malawi in three weeks. And so part of our trip and part of the work we were doing in Malawi was um, ensuring last minute details were set up. Um, and, and part of that was we got to visit a couple churches and, and worship with local believers. In fact, this day they were doing baptisms, which was really neat. And we got to witness that and be part of um, this church celebration. We also uh, were able to enjoy lunch together with another missionary couple from the good state of Ohio. Um, on the left is Tad and Carly. They're missionaries at an orphanage in Malawi. And we connected with them maybe a year ago through some other um, connections and contacts in country. And so they've been very helpful with Hugo and Bree and helping to think through what life is going to be like there, thinking through and working the immigration process and finances and banking and all the things that, that we just take for granted living in a country that we know well. And so we were able to have lunch with them, and, and that was a really nice time. And then we drove to where the, the guest house is being finished. So these are this is a building that we're going to be renting. And you can see uh, Hugo and Bree here. This is where they're going to be living. And then for those of us who have the opportunity to visit, uh, this is likely where we'll, we'll be staying. And so the guest house is going to be a really great launch point uh, for teams and for guests that come to Malawi with us. And you get a bit of an idea of the construction here and, and, and the necessity of a fence, and there's going to be razor wire. This is just the realities of, of living in a place like Malawi. Uh, inside, it's, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, the walls are actually not wooden, but they're brick that have been plastered over, tile floors. And this is, this is going to work out really well for our team. 
and we're very excited that this will be ready um, literally in a nick of time for them to move over. Part of the, the work that we had to do was to figure out furnishings. Uh, where, where do people sleep and, and so forth? And there's some imported furniture from mostly from China, um, which can be very expensive and it's imported from China, or you can go to the local markets and people are making furniture by hand, which is kind of like stepping back a couple hundred years in, in time where people are hand planing boards and, and making uh, really nice looking furniture uh, the old fashioned manual way, which is uh, probably what we're going to end up with. And so we're really just sort of investigating where to get stuff and what the cost might be. Um, and then the first week when Hugo and Bree move to Malawi in July, they'll be actually getting this furniture and what they might need. And then another part of that day was visiting where Dixon and his wife Rhoda live. Um, they had been renting a house for all these years, a small home uh, near to this one, which is their new home. And they've been building this house for the last eight years. So in Malawi, there's there's really a lack of financing. You don't you don't take a loan. You don't get a mortgage for a house and build it. You literally build the house brick by brick yourself. So molding your own bricks and 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 putting the bricks up and and plastering over and and everything that you can do manually, you do. And so for the last eight years, they've been working on this house. And just this last year, they were able to move in, and are super excited. And it's really. Um, it's really a great opportunity for, for them to minister to people in their local neighborhood and um, are just a, a really neat couple and are hosting three kids that are not even their own in their home, um, which is a very typical um, situation where you have siblings of, of, of other family members who can't take care of their kids for one reason or another. And so they've really opened up their home to take care of a lot of families. We had the opportunity to go back to Chikwangwala village. This is a community that we visited in December. And if you were uh, tracking back then and, and part of that update, uh, we actually installed a pump with our partner in Chikwangwala. And we wanted to go back and follow up and, and actually shoot um, a short documentary on the community and see the progress and how things are going. So along the way, we're uh, picking up people to help us um, in the vehicle here was um, a couple gentlemen. One translated for us from English to Chichewa, and another was a keyboard player. So we were planning on uh, collaborating with Africa Enterprise, which is a Christian organization that was sharing the gospel. And these guys were hitching a ride in our Land Cruiser. When we arrived, um, we found the pump in great condition, great working order. The pump site was pristine, in my opinion. So they built this beautiful brick wall and they even took br broken bricks and crushed them and made sort of like a gravel around the pump site. So it was extremely clean. This is one of the best examples of a pump structure that I've seen. Um, and, and it just goes to show how much they appreciate it and how much they're taking care of it. Um, and so you can see some of the, the people using it. And, and when we first arrived, you know, the, the word was getting out that, that we arrived and, and people are starting to trickle in and including some of these very curious kids. And this is Ray, who who thought it would be fun to show the kids how to make a paper airplane and fly it. And so that's what he's attempting to do here is to fly a paper airplane. So next time we go back, there might be paper airplanes everywhere. I don't know. But um, that was kind of a cool thing. And we decided to work with a local uh, film crew um, who makes videos, uh, mostly working for nonprofits like ours. But these are Malawian guys who have the right equipment and know how to to film and interview and record sound and and do editing. So Chisomo was the main guy, and so he's uh, you see the, his back here. But everything from having a drone to other footage, and we're really excited to be able to share this short documentary with you in the hope, hopeful not too distant future. But the short documentary was about this girl named Cecilia. So Cecilia is a 15 year old girl in the community. Um, when we arrived, we um, talked with several different people and families and, and asked you know, if anyone would like to be part of this. And there were several volunteers. And, and so Beatrice, um, who's a master at doing these things, uh, was able to, to choose a girl and, and, um, and, and get permission to, to film. And, and she was just tickled to death to share her story. Um, just as a, a reminder, Chikwangwala was a community where uh, a nearby community who gets water from the same place they get water was tragically attacked by a crocodile uh, last December. And so this was a this was a, a very heart wrenching story. It's something that that's going to stick with me for a very long time. 
And even through the course of interviewing with Cecilia, it turns out that her nephew uh, also was killed by a crocodile not too long ago. And so these are these are realities that are facing people um, in communities today. And it's something that I, I think it's just so hard as we're sitting in in our comfortable homes and our offices around the United States to think that this is even a threat um, to, to people in our world today. But we had the opportunity to, to uh, film her. And so the documentary, it's a short, it's a very short documentary, but it's trying to show like her life, what, what life was like. And so it was her home, her family, her life. And, um, and then just uh, where she used to get water, including the river where there's crocodiles in the river. And so here we are filming and, and getting the actual images. It's not just a river somewhere in Africa, but this is the actual spot. This is the actual community. These are the actual people. Um, and then the before and after, uh, Cecilia is on the left here. So during during the film, she actually changed into her school uniform. And uh, so she's on the left and she's um, at the pump and, and they were celebrating water with the life pump. Now this life pump gets about three, two to three hours of use a day, which is right around what you would consider for this size community. And, and it's really good because we're seeing this consistency over time. Um, some communities can be used much more, especially if multiple communities are using the same life pump. But once again, this shows and proves the reliability and the uptime of the pump. Um, just to remind us, in this part of the world, um, about 40% of the pumps are broken at any given time. And if you have a pump that's that works 80% of the time, so 80% of the year, that's considered good by most organizations and most people. And, and so we, we think that's actually terrible because that means about two months a year, a community doesn't have water and they're going back to the river, they're going back to the open well, like we just saw earlier. Um, and we just uh, crunched some data recently um, globally where we have all of our life pump links. So these are the satellite sensors that are collecting the data. And we found on average across all of the pumps that we have 99% uptime. And so this is over about the last two to three years of time where we've had life pump links installed. 99% uptime, which is just incredible. This is this is transformational. It's, it changes the status quo. It, it increases the standard to where where it should be. Um, it shouldn't be settling for for two one two months a year and not working. So to give perspective where this pump was relative to the the center of action. Um, so the, what you see here is the sound system that that we have, um, and we have a pastor. We have the translator. And then all the people who are sitting around watching. So it just kind of gives you a perspective of, of space, where the pump is, where the people were. And, and the corn stalks that you see behind the people, uh, that's actually enclosing a garden. So there was a large community garden that had just gotten started. Um, and they hadn't really, they don't, they, they just started the garden because now they have water close that then they can water the plants for the vegetables in the garden, which was very exciting to see. And there was a big celebration, lots of singing, lots of dancing. Uh, the preacher did a really great job. We were um, collaborating with um, Africa Enterprise, which is this evangelical group. And so we were really just witnesses to what they were doing in this community, which was really neat to be part of and to witness. Um, they shared the gospel. They they shared the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And um, it really hit home. And, and when there was an altar call, all of these people put up their hands. And so it was just a really... A really special moment to be part of that, uh, to see how how these communities are transforming, not with just physical water, but with living water, like we learned from the story of the woman at the well. And so it was uh, it was just really neat to be part of that, knowing that our role is helping to get these pumps in and do the engineering and seeing groups like Africa Enterprise um, excel at their role as well. Now, there's a, a lot of collaborating and a lot of planning that goes into making these things happen. And so a, a big chunk of the time that we had was was training and planning meetings and, and meeting with various partners. But it's not all work and no play. So one, one night we had the opportunity, um, some of our meetings were in the south of Malawi near a place called Cape McClear, which is in the bay, on a bay on Lake Malawi. So Lake Malawi is one of the largest freshwater bodies in the world. Um, and, and they have these very colorful fish called cichlids. So we had the opportunity to have some meetings near there, which was a central location for some of our partners in the southern part of Malawi. And, and as a fun thing, we decided we would go camping, essentially, instead of staying at a hotel. And you can see sort of 
uh, where where we got to stay, it kind of, uh, it, it's not for everybody. This is a little bit of Swiss Family Robinson, which is right up my alley, being, uh, you know, trained as an Eagle Scout. I, I love this stuff. Uh, there's no running water, no electricity, no no internet signal, no, no Wi-Fi, no cell phone signal. Um, but it was one of the, the really neat experiences to be able to see the, the nature side of Malawi, um, including a three foot long monitor lizard, which was not too far from where we were sleeping. And I was just hoping and praying wouldn't get into my tent somehow. But our time was spent uh, primarily in planning and strategy meetings. So here we are with Beatrice and Dixon um, in the center is one of our volunteers who's been working with us in marketing and communications in Malawi and really working through and introducing part of uh, this management system that we've been using called EOS Traction, which has helped a lot and introducing that to our field office and now planning with them. Uh, the next day, we had a, an important meeting with World Vision Malawi, who was our first original partner in Malawi and has remained strong since 2013 when we started working with them. And in fact, they announced that they're putting in and, and, and funding 15 more life pumps um, by the end of this year in just Malawi. So it's really, really neat to see how momentum is catching and how uh, people are excited about life pump and how uh, life pump is making such a difference in so many communities. Uh, we also met in a couple occasions a couple different pastors which i felt were very inspirational to me so pastor zizi in the left and and pastor gibson on the right um, are pastors from both the north and the south parts of malawi and just hearing their stories and, and just hearing about what's going on in these countries and in the rural areas and the challenges they have um, is is very uh, motivating to want to do more uh, we, we wrapped up the day uh, with meetings, uh, meeting with the Rotary Club in Malawi in Lalongwe. So this is this was actually a celebration dinner that we were invited to, um, where uh, just very, very recently in the last couple of weeks, we've learned that the Rotary grant that we've been working on for seemingly two years has been officially approved, that the funding is in and we're ready to roll, where this is putting in 20 life pumps with Rotary and so Rotary is funding these life pumps. We're putting in 20 life pumps across Malawi and providing training and capacity building and, uh, and supplies for COVID as COVID is starting to get worse and worse in that part of the world. So this was a celebration and, and very exciting that, that we got to be part of that. There were something like 27 Rotary clubs in Ohio who are part of this project. So this is a very large Rotary project and, and we're very blessed to be part of that. Now, of course, getting out of Malawi is not indifferent from getting into Malawi. And so you have to get a, a COVID test to also exit. Uh, this one was a lot less pleasant than the first test in Ohio. I liked, I liked the guy in Ohio a lot more than the guy in Malawi um, when he took the sample. Uh, but nevertheless, we survived and we got our test results back. And, and lo and behold, I'm still negative. Um, so I can shake your hand. Now, there are, um, uh, you know, some things about Malawi that, that never cease to amaze me. Um, you know, things I'm learning even after visiting now for eight years uh, and numerous trips and, and really, um, you know, loving Malawi and the people of Malawi. Uh, number one is um, if you're ever in short supply of battery acid, you can buy battery acid at the local grocery store. So if you happen to be in Malawi, um, don't fear if you need battery acid, it's available. And also, um, you can get honest to goodness uh, ice cream in Malawi, which was the first time that I had ever experienced this. And I had to give Beatrice a hard time because um, I'm not sure how I haven't known this for eight years now. But if you go to Malawi, and I hope you do and have a chance, um, you can get real honest good ice cream at, at a little ice cream shop that, that we were introduced to. So there's some really good things about Malawi besides uh, you know all the other good things I talked about. Um, and I also have a lot of hope as we're as we're talking about um, helping to solve problems. Really, it's it's a matter of empowering people. It's not it's not a matter of coming in and doing. It's a matter of coming alongside, providing resources, technical assistance, but training and empowering. And and I was just encouraged by um, what I saw at a local uh, soccer game, also known as football in Malawi, a very very popular sport in Malawi. We're driving along and. And um, and we wanted to get some some video of these kids playing, and and so we stop, and so you see in the, the right picture, uh, there's Dixon, there's Bree, and they're they're out there with the camera, and 
and they were using this homemade soccer ball, which I felt um, was was very intriguing. So I, I love the the creativity here, the innovation. What they did is took a balloon and they basically wrapped it with rubber straps, and then they wrapped like a plastic bag around it with some some string. And and this is not a soccer ball that I think any of our kids would ever play with, but these kids were having the best time, and they were amazing. They they were they were playing soccer better than I could ever imagine playing soccer myself, and and better than probably, you know, most of us could ever imagine playing soccer. And yet they were having a great time with essentially something that cost nothing. And, and they were very creative in creating things like this soccer ball. And so I'm, I'm very encouraged by if we can be the catalyst, if we can help tweak just the right things, come alongside, not take shortcuts, not, not have too low of a standard, but have the right quality standard, have, um, have, have endurance and perseverance, these countries are going to thrive and that's that's very exciting um and so i just really appreciate you know everyone who's been part of this to to help make that happen now on the way back this is uh us, us returning uh, i mentioned on the way to malawi it's about a 26 hour flight and combination of flights on the way back it's it's a 30 hour combination of flights because you're going against the wind and so this is hugo and brie uh, Hugo looks like he's ready to take his uh, COVID shot there, um, but there I am uh, at, at the airport, landed in in, um, in Washington, Dulles, and this was my re-entry meal. I got a potbelly milkshake, and um, I can't tell you how good that tastes after about two weeks of traveling. Um, but on the airplane, I've also learned how to cope with airplane food, and if, if those of you who have, have been on these long international flights, you probably know what I'm talking about. So I, I usually subside on a, a diet of, of tomato juice. Uh, tea because it's been boiled water and uh, bottled water because you need to be hydrated. And so that's usually probably why I usually lose a couple pounds on these trips. But if you would join me in, um, in, in praying for a number of things that are going on around the world, first of all, Hugo and Brie are moving July 8th. And this is, this is a huge deal for this couple. Um, I'm just very inspired by, by people coming alongside and and doing God's work and um, and and putting their 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 neck out there and, and saying I'm willing to take the risk I'm willing to move to another country young people who are stepping up to the plate and really making things happen um, it takes all of us it takes people in behind the scenes on the back line you know people who are doing the engineering people who are giving financially people who are praying people who are making connections and managing but it also takes people on the front lines it takes people who are willing and able to be in country and to live and breathe that. And so Hugo and Bree are going to be a huge part of that uh, going forward at our Malawi office. Uh, we have life pump installations currently going on in Haiti, which was a, a big a big deal because the, the, the situation with security has been a big issue there for quite a while. Um, our Golden Cup ride, which is a big fundraising event that's kicking off next week officially, and hopefully you're involved. And if not, would love to share more. Um, is kicking off next week to fundraise for seven more Life Pump Plus campaigns in the country of Malawi, which is very excited and much needed. Uh, we also have more pumps heading to Malawi and Zambia in September that that, that shipment and that container would get off in time. We have a container in route presently on a truck somewhere in eastern Africa heading to Zimbabwe for more Life Pumps that are going to be installed and we have a team as soon as that as soon as there's confirmation that those pumps have arrived at the compound there's we have a team that's ready to go and help provide training for those life pumps and assist and then we have life pump updates going on later this year in kenya and lastly we have an august shipment of life pumps to guatemala so as you can see there's a lot going on um, around the globe it's not just malawi but there's a lot of very exciting things um, the world is is still a difficult place to live in. Shipping logistics has gotten even harder because of COVID. Um, raw materials have increased in price, but nevertheless, people's need for what we're doing is still there, if not even bigger than what it was before. So I just want to end on this. This is my my uh, youngest daughter, and um, and she's modeling the Golden Cup Ride T-shirt, which uh, turns out that she's uh, wearing the t-shirt backwards, but she thought that the golden cup should be on the front versus the back. So she decided that, that she'd wear it this way. Um, but I, uh, I just thank you for taking time during your lunchtime here and um, and just hearing more about what we're doing together, what God's doing um, in a country 
um, all the way across the world in Zambia and Malawi and how we can do so much more, uh, how this doesn't um, this doesn't end and that there's much more that we can do together. So I'm going to end there and uh, turn it over to Rhonda and hopefully we have some uh, good Q&A out here. Uh, thanks so much, Greg. So That's fantastic. So we would um, love to take questions. We have 15 minutes. Um, you can raise your hand um, or you can um, just start asking questions or put um, your comments into the um, your questions into the comment section. So does anyone at this point have any questions? So we have one question um, from Greg Kramer. Here. What is your most urgent volunteer needs? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, and, uh, and and I should also mention the project that, that you're working on with us and, and some others even on this call. Um, you know, we, we have a number of projects that are going on. In fact, I think we, we just tallied up recently. We have 40, 40 active uh, um, volunteers are working with us in different projects, technical capacities. I think we have seven different projects with those 40 um, engineers and scientists and, and designers that are working with us. Um, at the moment, our biggest need for volunteering is to help promote the, and, and, and Rhonda can jump on this too, but I would say um, with the Golden Cup Ride, which is our big fundraising event, and also to help raise awareness with our Life in Malawi program. So this is hosting a small event um, with your friends, your family, that we're sharing and, and making uh, what life in Malawi is like. And so that's also a fundraising opportunity. And then as projects go on, we continue to uh, get to know people and plug people in. I know that even recently, we've we've been building some test equipment at our shop facility, partner facility, and and we've had help uh, putting that together, making the plans, building it, machining parts. Um, we're going to be piloting and testing our first prototypes of the Life Latrine project, which uh, several um, uh, uh, people on the call are part of that project as well. So we're going to be prototyping, digging holes, putting in our our new pit latrine system, um, and testing that out. So, so really, you know, kind of the the first the first step is always, you know, joining us and helping us raise awareness and 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 um, and understanding kind of where the desires are. And then as projects come along, we have we have needs for project managers, we have we have needs for uh, designers, CAD designers, we have needs for uh, people who have expertise in shipping and logistics. And so, it's really everything you can imagine to run an organization um, where we're constantly building capacity. Great. Does anyone else have any questions? I think, Greg, I think they're still muted. You might want to unmute if someone would like to talk in it um, openly. All right, I see a question here. Are there, Are there any? Yeah, are there any logistics um, procedures involved with removing the old pumps or can we just remove it and install the life pump? And that's from Chad. Yeah, yeah great question. Thanks, Chad. Um, re really, it's uh, the, the answer is um, it's it's not too difficult, um, assuming that the well was installed correctly in the first place. So essentially, when we're doing a retrofit, it's a matter of pulling out the old pump, which can literally take 20 or 30 minutes depending on how deep it is and and we can use the exact same well we can use the same pump stand so we designed the life pump so that we could do retrofits um, which is which is a typical scenario where a pump has been installed beyond its design depth um, or the well was drilled deep enough um, but the pump can't go deep enough so there's actually much more well that you could go down further and so we can pull out the old pump and we can put in a new pump without any problems and and generally speaking that works really well where where uh, one could run into problems is if the well itself was not drilled properly which unfortunately uh, there are a lot of quality control issues out there with well drillers and so it's it's a cutthroat business in many cases where contractors are cutting corners they're putting in wells that aren't deep enough they're drilling during the wet season 
uh, where there's water um, at, at a shallower depth. And then during the dry season, it goes dry. And so that's actually a huge problem in well drilling. So when we're doing retrofits, we want to know what the well history is. Was this well properly developed? Um, is there a proper liner? Um, does it run dry during the dry season if there was another pump on there? And if it checks all those boxes, which, which uh, you know, when, when you ask the right questions, you can figure it out, then, then there can be an installation. There's been, there's been a few cases over the years where life pumps have been put on wells that are seasonal, which then is, is a huge problem because what happens is the water drops below where the pump is set. And that's really a hydrological problem. That's, that's not a pump problem. And so in those cases, the wells have, or, or sorry, the pump has to be set deeper or the well has to be, a new well has to be drilled deeper. Thanks, Greg. Do we have any more questions? What would be Hugo's role um, in going to Malawi over the next three years? Yeah, so so Hugo is part of our field programs department. So Hugo is is an engineer who um, actually originally knew from Ohio State, teaching at Ohio State, and so he joined our team uh, a while back. And so what he's going to be doing is heading up our engineering in field. So this is not just um, going to work on life pumps, but it's to work on partially on helping to scale and develop the life pump program, and specifically the training of trainer program. As we're as we're creating better training materials and training procedures, but then we also um, have him working on in-country uh, appropriate technology development. So this is when there's an in-country problem that either he can work on alone or with his in-country um, colleagues, where we're looking to build capacity with Malawian engineers, for instance. So like not just sending in engineers from other countries like America, but but building capacity and training. Um, where, where there's a, tr a necessity for training. And then kind of the, the third area is, is to support uh, the field portion of piloting of technologies that may be developed in the United States, for instance. So in other words, um, sometimes some projects are, are, are more complicated than others. Um, maybe there's a lot of um, programming or electronics involved or strength of materials or something, manufacturing. So it's, it really takes the expertise of, the, of, of a larger team in America uh, to work on these projects, and, but then it needs piloting in country. So he would be the one in charge of, of uh, developing slash executing the pilot programs according to uh, what the engineering teams in the U.S. are looking for and, and gathering that data, that gathering the quantitative data, providing feedback, um, and then being part of, of redesign efforts you know, as necessary. So it's a really critical role and, and providing that, that in-country real-time support. Um, sometimes uh, there's there's issues that that we hear about, and and um, you know you might hear oh the you know for example in the pump you know it might be oh the pump is um, you know not producing as much water as it used to, or the pump is making a funny sound. Even though we've had pumps now running for eight years nonstop, yeah. we've had we've had some pumps that are are ha had run for five years of never being touched. Um, in many of those cases, um, it's it's a matter of of understanding how much wear and tear is there. So normally, what we have to do is is take a trip, take off parts, bring them back to America, analyze them. Well, that's a very time consuming and costly process. So we want to be able to do that sort of thing in real time in country, which will really help reduce our product development cycle time. Awesome, thank you. We have a question from Bruce Flora: Does water from a new well have to be purified? Uh, it, it shouldn't be. So um, the, as, as far as like the hand pump work that we do and, and most hand pumps, there's there's not a purification step to it. So the, the well itself, generally speaking, and, and this is not like a 100 percent thing, but generally speaking, if you're drilling down and hitting an aquifer um, and the well is properly sealed. So in other words, um, surface water is not able to contaminate your aquifer. Um, the, the water is generally considered um, safe. And so that's with like WHO, World Health Organization standards safe. And so there's testing that that is, is done by the driller uh, to, to test certain parameters. Um, so the water coming out of the pump should be safe without any any chlorination treatment, without any any filtration. Um, there, there's a there, there's a big debate within the international, you know, water 
NGO world about what even safe means. You know, what standard is there? Um, or is it being followed? Um, how often do you test the well? So there, there's, it's a very complicated question um, to, to fully answer because there's not 100% alignment. But the water that, that, that we're specifying for life pump is, is that it's safe at, at point of use um, versus needing any sort of like secondary treatment, filtration, or chlorination. Um, in some cases, like we've run into this where the water is considered safe, but it has like a high iron content. And so you can have a certain concentration of iron. And then when it oxidizes, when it hits, when it hits air for long enough, you know, within a matter of minutes, sometimes um, it can turn like a darker color. Um, we, we only saw that once in Kenya. So like it depends on the, the, the formations underground and, and what minerals might be um, in the water. But like in that case, it's considered it's still considered safe. But then people still don't want it because it looks colored and, and people like clear water um, and, and I can't blame them. And so in those cases, like th there needs to be some sort of other treatment system uh, that would go along with it. Great. Uh, next question we have is how many trips abroad yet this year do you have planned? Uh, well, personally, I, I think I think personally, I'll probably travel once once more and, and try to hit several countries. Um, I know we have we have another team that's heading out in uh, in, in probably in July um, to Zimbabwe to to work with our partner, the Corona Mission Hospital. Um, we're we're also looking at um, possibility of a trip to Kenya end of this year and probably. Uh, p potentially Haiti and Guatemala. So it really just depends on like where we're at uh, as an organization as um, with COVID uh, traveling has slowed down. Um, so we, we we used to do a little bit more and had more teams and so forth, but um, probably have another trip back to Malawi um, probably in October, November as well. So rel relatively speaking, I think we'll have, I don't know, five more international team trips, if you want to call it that. Um, but that's, um, and, and that's just for the remainder of this calendar year. Awesome. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Great. Well, if we, um, we don't have any more questions in the chat, um, we are going to give you back a few minutes of your time. We want to thank you for participating today. Greg, thanks so much. And thanks for all the wonderful questions. Um, you'll be able to um, share. We actually recorded the um, meeting, so you'll be able to share this recording and um, you'll be receiving it in your June e-news, which will go out on Thursday. So thank you again. Thank you, Greg and Rhonda. Much appreciated. Very informative.